Section 9 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. The Folklore of Common Salt. Part 2. 8. Salt is a Magical Substance. The natives of Morocco regard salt as a talisman against evil and a common amulet among the Neapolitan poor is a bit of rock salt suspended from the neck. The peasants of the Hartz mountain region in Germany believe that three grains of salt in a milk pot will keep witches away from the milk, and to preserve butter from their uncanny influences, it was a custom in the county of Aberdeen, Scotland, some years ago, to put salt on the lid of a churn. In Normandy also the peasants are wont to throw a little salt into a vessel containing milk, in order to protect the cow who gave the milk from the influences of witchcraft. Peculiar notions about the magical properties of salt are common among American Negroes. Thus in some regions a new tenant will not move into a furnished house until all objects therein have been thoroughly salted, with a view to the destruction of witch germs. Another example of the supernatural attributes ascribed to salt is the opinion current among uneducated people in some communities, of its potency in casting a spell over obnoxious individuals. For this purpose it is sufficient either to sprinkle salt over the sleeping form of an enemy, or on the grave of one of his ancestors. Another kind of salt spell in vogue in the south of England consists in throwing a little salt into the fire on three successive Friday nights, while saying these words, quote, It is not this salt I wish to burn. It is my lover's heart to turn, that he may neither rest nor happy be until he comes and speaks to me. End quote. On the third Friday night, the disconsolate damsel expects her lover to appear. Every one is familiar with the old saying, quote, You can catch a bird with your hand if you first put some salt on its tail. End quote. This quaint expression has been thought to imply that if one can get near enough to a bird to place salt on its tail, its capture is an easy matter. The phrase, however, may be more properly attributed to a belief in the magical properties of salt in casting a spell over the bird. Otherwise, any substance might be equally effective for the purpose of catching it. The writer remembers having read somewhere an old legend about a young man who playfully threw some salt on the back of a witch sitting next to him at a table and the witch thereupon acquired such an increase of avoir du poids that she was unable to move until the young man obligingly brushed away the salt. The ancient Teutons believed that the swift flight of birds was caused by certain powerful spirits of the air. Now salt is a foe to ghostly might, imparts weight to bodies, and impedes their motion. Therefore the rationale of its operation when placed upon a bird's tail is easily intelligible. In the province of Quebec, French Canadians sometimes scatter salt about the doors of their stables to prevent those mischievous little imps called lutins from entering and teasing the horses by sticking burrs in their manes and tails. The lutin, or gobelin, is akin to the Scandinavian household spirit who is fond of children and horses and who whips and pinches the former when they're naughty but caresses them when good. In Marsala, West Sicily, a horse, mule, or donkey, on entering a new stall, is thought to be liable to molestation by fairies. As a precautionary measure, therefore, a little salt is placed on the animal's back, and this is believed to ensure freedom from lameness or other evil resulting from fairy spite. Common salt has long enjoyed a reputation as a means of procuring disenchantment. It was an ingredient of a salve against nocturnal goblin visitors used by the Saxons in England and described in one of their ancient leech books. While in the annals of folk medicine are to be found numerous references to its reputed virtues as a magical therapeutic agent. In Scotland, when a person is ailing of some affection whose nature is not apparent, as much salt as can be placed on a sixpence is dissolved in water, and the solution is then applied three times to the soles of the patient's feet, to the palms of his hands, and to his forehead. He is then expected to taste the mixture, 
a portion of which is thrown over the fire while saying, Lord, preserve us for a scathe. The Germans of Buffalo Valley in central Pennsylvania believe that a boy may be cured of homesickness by placing salt in the hems of his trousers and making him look up the chimney. In India, the natives rub salt and wine on the affected part of the body as a cure for scorpion bites, believing that the success of this treatment is due to the supernatural virtue of the salt in scaring away the fiends who caused the pain. An ancient Irish charm of great repute in cases of suspected fairy stroke consisted in placing on a table three equal portions of salt in three parallel rows. The would-be magician then encircles the salt with his arm and repeats the Lord's Prayer thrice over each row. Then, taking the hand of the fairy-struck person, he says over it, quote, By the power of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let this disease depart and the spell of evil spirits be broken. End quote. Then follows a solemn adjuration and command addressed to the supposed demon, and the charm is complete. In Bavaria and the Ukraine, in order to ascertain whether a child has been the victim of bewitchment, the mother licks its forehead, and if her sense of taste reveals thereby a marked saline flavor, she is convinced that her child has been under the influence of an evil eye. In the Swiss canton of Bern, a person is believed to be amply fortified against all kinds of spiritual enemies by the simple expedient of carrying a piece of fresh bread and a psalm book in the right and left coat pockets, respectively, provided one is careful to have some rock salt either in each vest pocket or inside a briar wood cane upon which three crosses have been cut. In Bohemia, a mother seeks to protect her daughter from evil glances, by placing a little bread and salt in her pocket, and when a young girl goes out for a walk, the mother sprinkles salt on the ground behind her, so that she may not lose her way. Holy water has been employed in the religious ceremonies of many peoples as a means of purifying both persons and things, and also to keep away demons. Sprinkling and washing with it were important features of the Greek ritual. The holy water of the Roman Catholic Church is prepared by exercising and blessing salt and water separately, after which the salt is dissolved in the water and a benediction pronounced upon the mixture. In the Hawaiian ritual, sea water was sometimes preferred. A Magyar housemistress will not give any salt to a woman who may come to the door and ask for it in the early morning, believing that any such would-be borrower is surely a witch, but in order to keep away all witches and hags, she strews salt on the threshold. On St. Lucien's day, neither salt nor fire must be taken out of the house. Among the Japanese, the mysterious preservative qualities of salt are the source of various superstitions. The mistress of a household will not buy it at night, and when purchased in the daytime, a small quantity is thrown into the fire in order to prevent discord in the family, and to avert misfortune generally. In Scotland, salt was formerly in high repute as a charm, and the salt box was the first chattel to be removed to a new dwelling. When Robert Burns, in the year 1789, was about to occupy a new house at Ellisland, he was escorted on his route thither, along the banks of the river Nith, by a procession of relatives, and in their midst was borne a bowl of salt resting on the family Bible. In some places in the north of England, the giving away of salt is a dangerous procedure, for if the salt thus given comes into the possession of an evil wisher, it places the donor entirely in the power of such a person. In Upper Egypt, previous to the setting out of a caravan, it is customary for the native women to throw salt on burning coals, which are carried in earthen vessels and set down before the different loads. While so doing, they exclaim, May you be blessed in going and coming, and such incantations they believe render inert all the machinations of evil spirits. 9. Miscellaneous Remarks on Salt Among the peasants of the Spanish province of Andalusia, the word salt is synonymous with gracefulness and charm of manner, and no more endearing or flattering language can be used in addressing a woman whether wife or sweetheart, than to call her the salt box of my love. The phrase, may you be well salted, is also current as an expression of affectionate regard. 
scotch fishermen have a traditional custom of salting their nets for luck and they also sometimes throw a little salt into the sea to blind the fairies in the isle of man the interchange of salt is regarded as indispensable to every business transaction while manx beggars have even been known to refuse an alms if proffered without it in syracuse sicily salt has won distinction as a symbol of wisdom through a curious misinterpretation of the words sedis sapientiae of the so-called laurentine litany these words becoming in the mouths of the people sale e sapienza salt and wisdom salt and bread representing the necessaries of life are the first articles taken into the dwelling of a newly married pair in russia and in pomerania at the close of a wedding breakfast a servant carries about a plate containing salt upon which the guests place presents of money in olden times bread and salt were reckoned the simplest and most indispensable articles of diet and were offered to guests as a guarantee of hospitality and friendliness the universal reputation of salt as a symbol of good will is shown in the proverbs and current sayings of many nations cicero in his treatise on friendship wrote that age increased the value of friendships even as it improved the quality of certain wines and he added further that there was truth in the proverb quote, many pecks of salt must be eaten together to bring friendship to perfection end quote inasmuch as salt is a necessary and wholesome article of diet a generous use of it is reckoned beneficial evan marlet body f r c s in his history of salt page seventy eight comments with some asperity on the custom prevalent at the tables of english gentlefolk of placing salt in the tiniest receptacles as if it were a most expensive substance he regards it as anything but edifying Quote, to see the host and his guests in the most finical grotesque manner help themselves to the almost infinitesimal quantities of salt as if it were a mark of good breeding and delicacy End quote. on the contrary he continues such stupid customs of good society are truly indicative of mental weakness and profound ignorance in a treatise on the dignity and utility of salt by jean de marconi percheron paris fifteen eighty four this mineral is likened in value to the four elements recognized by the ancients earth air fire and water and indeed on account of its importance for the maintenance of health in the animal economy salt has been termed a fifth element so highly did the thracians of old prize this commodity that they bartered slaves in exchange for it whence originated the phrase sale emptum mancipium the egyptian geographer cosmas stated that a salt currency was in use in africa in the sixth century and marco polo wrote that salt was a common medium of exchange among certain asiatic peoples in the thirteenth century in tibet for example pieces of salt shaped in a mould and weighing about half a pound each served as small change eighty such pieces were equal in value to a saggio of fine gold corresponding to the roman solidus worth about three dollars salt was moreover used as money at this time in yunnan and other provinces of southwestern china felix dubois in his timbuktu the mysterious page one twenty three comments on the rarity of salt in the interior of the sudan and says that it is the most valuable commodity of that region the true gold of the sudanese the bulk of the salt supply of timbuktu comes from the salt mines of todini which are situated in the great sahara desert some three hundred miles away to the north here the salt is found in abundance beneath a scanty layer of sand and is dug up in lumps and fashioned into blocks small pieces of this rock salt are useful to the traveller as money and are readily accepted as such by the sudanese merchants the camels of southern mongolia require a certain amount of salt in order to remain in good condition instinctively therefore they browse upon the saline efflorescence which is found on the grassy plains or steppes of asia baron humboldt in his aspects of nature berlin eighteen o eight wrote that these plains were covered with juicy evergreen soda plants and that many of them glistened from afar with flakes of exuded salt which much resembled newly fallen snow 
When camels do not find this efflorescence, they sometimes show their craving for its saline flavor by taking white stones in their mouths, supposing them to be lumps of salt. Owing to the universality of its use, salt has been termed the cosmopolitan condiment. The craving for this substance is not confined to man, but is shared by the lower animals, and its hygienic value for horses and cows is well known. Wild animals travel long distances over deserts and prairies or through swamps and jungles to reach salt licks. It may be that this natural craving for salt, which is common to man and beast, may have suggested a custom of etiquette in Abyssinia, for when a native of that country desires to pay an especially delicate attention to a friend or guest, he produces a piece of rock salt and graciously permits the latter to lick it with his tongue, a custom not a whit more ridiculous than the ceremonious offering of snuff and the social sneeze of modern civilization. In certain portions of the dark continent, salt is esteemed a great luxury and is relished by native children quite as keenly as candy in more favored lands. In the region of Accra, on the coast of Guinea, salt is said to rank next to gold in value, and according to Mungo Park, among the Mandigos and Bambaras, West African tribes whose members are unusually intelligent. The phrase, flavoring one's food with salt, implies the possession of wealth. The Namaquas, inhabitants of the Hottentot country, share so little the sentiments of their neighbors regarding salt that they consider it a superfluous article having no value whatever. About the year 1830, there appeared in England a volume by a certain Dr. Howard with the following curious title, quote, Salt the forbidden fruit, or food, and the chief cause of diseases of the body and mind of man and of animals, as taught by the ancient Egyptian priests and wise men, and by scripture in accordance with the author's experience of many years. End quote. As may well be imagined from its title, this book treats of salt as a most obnoxious substance, abstinence from which, as an article of diet, is essential to the maintenance of health. The use of salt as an article of food was moreover thought to render one irascible and melancholic, and in illustration of this view may be quoted the following passage from Mufeuze and His England by John Lilly, Maestre of Art, 1580. Quote, in sooth, gentlemen, I seldom eat salt for fear of anger, and if you give me in token that I want wit, then you will make choleric before I eat it. For women, be they never so foolish, would ever be thought wise. I stayed not long for mine answer, but as well quickened by her former talk as desirous to cry quittance for her present tongue, said thus, quote, If to eat store of salt cause one to fret, and to have no salt signifies lack of wit, then do you cause me to marvel that eating no salt you are so captious, and loving no salt you are so wise? when indeed so much wit is sufficient for a woman, as when she is in the rain, can warn her to come out of it. End quote. In a recent article in the Journal of Hygiene, the writer affirms that the general belief in the necessity of the use of salt for the maintenance of health is mischievous, for many people in their zeal to make the most of a good thing are wont to eat salt as a seasoner of all kinds of food, thus an abnormal craving for the saline flavor is acquired and the condiment is used in excess, thereby unduly taxing the secretory organs, whereas in reality but a small quantity of salt is requisite. Persons addicted to the so-called salt habit have a perverted taste, and are naturally total failures as epicures, for how can anyone assume to be a dainty feeder who disguises the true flavor of every dish, and whose palate refuses to be tickled by the choicest morsels, unless these smack strongly of salt? But even in our times, the use of salt as a relish is sometimes deprecated as unnecessary, if not positively harmful. Thus it is argued that this substance arrests or retards the physiological processes of disintegration and renewal of the cells which compose the tissues of the living body, processes essential to the maintenance of life and health. A recent advocate of this theory maintains that the fondness for salt shown by some domesticated animals is due to an acquired taste rather than to an instinctive craving, for dogs and cats easily grow to like such artificial products as ice cream and beer. As to the occasional visits of wild animals to salt licks, 
The fact that such visits are comparatively infrequent has been thought to prove that these animals periodically require the medicinal effects of saline waters on the same principle which leads people of wealth and fashion to visit certain spas of Europe or America. The writer above mentioned suggests that whereas each article of food has its own individual flavor, the addition of salt makes them all taste alike, and if an inveterate user of salt will forego this favorite condiment for a month, he will then for the first time be enabled properly to appreciate the true flavors of meats and vegetables. In the Revelations of Egyptian Mysteries by Robert Howard, the use of salt as a relish is characterized as an infringement of that law of nature which forbids animals to partake of mineral substances as food. History may indeed vouch for the antiquity of the custom, but can furnish no proof of its propriety. Indeed, the writer alleges in the above work that salt is a most pernicious substance and the direct cause of many ills. The idea conveyed by the phrase, enough is as good as a feast, applies in full force to the use of salt as a condiment, for an excess of this substance in one's food certainly spoils its flavor. According to one version of a Romanian forest myth, a prince, while following the chase, came upon a beautiful laurel tree whose branches were of golden hue. This tree so pleased his fancy that he determined to have his dinner beneath its shade, and gave orders to that effect. Preparations were made accordingly, but during the temporary absence of the cook, a fair maiden emerged from the tree and strewed a quantity of salt upon the viands, after which she re-entered the tree which closed over her. When the prince returned and began eating his dinner, he scolded the cook for using too much salt, and the cook quite naturally protested his innocence. On the following day the same thing occurred, and the prince thereupon determined to keep watch, in order, if possible, to detect the culprit. On the third day, when the maiden came forth from the tree on mischief bent, the prince caught her and carried her away, and she became his loyal wife. This section may be appropriately concluded with the following translation of a Roman legend illustrating the value of common salt as an article of food. Quote, the Value of Salt, a Roman Folk Tale There was once a king who had three daughters, and he was very anxious to know which of them loved him most. He tried them in various ways, and it always seemed as if the youngest daughter came out best by the test. Yet he was never satisfied, because he was prepossessed with the idea that the elder ones loved him most. One day he thought he would settle the matter once for all, by asking each separately how much she loved him. So he called the eldest by herself and asked her how much she loved him. As much as the bread we eat, was her reply, and he said within himself, She must, as I thought, love me the most of all, for bread is the first necessary of our existence, without which we cannot live. She means, therefore, that she loves me so much she could not live without me. Then he called the second daughter by herself and said to her, How much do you love me? And she answered, As much as wine. That is a good answer, too, said the king to himself. It is true she does not seem to love me quite so much as the eldest, but still scarcely can one live without wine, so that there is not much difference. Then he called the youngest by herself and said to her, And you, how much do you love me? And she answered, As much as salt. Then the king said, What a contemptible comparison! She only loves me as much as the cheapest and commonest thing that comes to the table. This is as much as to say she doesn't love me at all. I always thought it was so. I will never see her again. Then he ordered that a wing of the palace should be shut up from the rest, where she should be served with everything belonging to her condition in life, but where she should live by herself apart and never come near him. Here she lived then, all alone. But though her father fancied she did not care for him, she pined so much at being kept away from him that at last she was worn out and could bear it no longer. The room that had been given her had no windows on the street that she might not have the amusement of seeing what was going on in the town. But they looked upon an inner courtyard. Here she sometimes saw the cook come out and wash vegetables at the fountain. Cook! Cook! she called one day as she saw him pass thus under the window. 
the cook looked up with a good-natured face which gave her encouragement don't you think cook i must be very lonely and miserable up here all alone yes signorina he replied i often think i should like to help you get out but i dare not think of it the king would be so angry no i don't want you to do anything to disobey the king answered the princess but would you really do me a favor which would make me very grateful indeed oh yes signorina anything which i can do without disobeying the king replied the faithful servant then this is it said the princess will you just oblige me so far as to cook papa's dinner to-day without any salt in anything not the least grain in anything at all let it be as good a dinner as you like but no salt in anything will you do that i i see replied the cook with a knowing nod yes depend on me i will do it that day at dinner the king had no salt in the soup no salt in the boiled meat no salt in the roast no salt in the fried what is the meaning of this said the king as he pushed dish after dish away from him there's not a single thing i can eat to-day i don't know what they have done to everything but there's not a single thing that has got the least taste let the cook be called so the cook came before him what have you done to the victuals to-day said the king sternly you've sent up a lot of dishes and no one alive can tell one from another they're all of them exactly alike and there's not one of them can be eaten speak the cook answered hearing your majesty say that salt was the commonest thing that comes to table and altogether so worthless and contemptible i considered in my mind whether it was a thing that at all deserved to be served up to the table of the king and judging that it was not worthy i abolished it from the king's kitchen and dressed all the meats without it barring this the dishes are the same that are sent every day to the table of the king then the king understood the value of salt and he comprehended how great was the love of his youngest child for him so he sent and had her apartment opened and called her to him never to go away any more ten the salt cellar the rhetorician arnobius in his work disputationes contra gentes wrote that the pagans were wont to sanctify or hallow their tables by setting salt cellars thereon for owing to the fact that salt was employed at every sacrifice as an offering to the gods and owing moreover to its reputed divine attributes receptacles containing salt were also held sacred indeed the salt cellar partook of the nature of a holy vessel associated with the temple in general and more particularly with the altar pythagoras said that salt was the emblem of justice for as it preserves all things and prevents corruption so justice preserves whatever it animates and without it all is corrupted he therefore directed that a salt cellar should be placed upon the table at every meal in order to remind men of this emblematic virtue of salt the romans considered salt to be a sacred article of food and it was a matter of religious principle with them to see that no other dish was placed upon the table before the salt was in position a shell served as a receptacle for salt on the table of the roman peasant but at the repast of the wealthy citizen the silver salt cellar which was usually an heirloom was placed in the middle of the table and the same custom prevailed in england in medieval times in a work entitled antiquates culinariae compiled by the rev richard warner london seventeen ninety one are to be found reprinted from an old paper roll elaborate directions for the preparation of the banquet table on the occasion of a great feast at the enthroning of george neville as chancellor of england and archbishop of york in the sixth year of edward the fourth a d fourteen sixty six after the laying of the chief napkin the officials of the king's household charged with such duties were directed to bring salt bread and trenchers and to quote, set the salt right under the middest of the cloth of estate end quote minute directions follow regarding the proper disposition of the trenchers knives spoons and bread and their exact relations to the salt which was treated with special deference throughout the ceremony the hon horace walpole published an account of the formalities observed at the setting of queen elizabeth's dinner-table as described by a german traveller who was present on such an occasion after the tablecloth had been spread two gentlemen appeared one bearing a rod and the other having a salt cellar a plate and bread 
After kneeling three times with the utmost reverence, they placed these three articles upon the table and withdrew. Later in the ceremony came an unmarried lady dressed in white silk and a matron carrying a tasting knife. The former, having thrice prostrated herself, approached the table in the most graceful manner and rubbed with bread and salt the plates provided for the guests. After this, the yeoman of the guard, clad in scarlet, and each with a golden rose upon his back, entered bareheaded, bringing a course of four and twenty dishes. In the households of the English nobility, a similar custom prevailed, a rhythmical code of instructions to servants of the fifteenth century required that the salt should always be the first article placed on the festive board after the cloth was laid. Quote, tu dois mettre premièrement, en tout lieu et en tout hostel, la nappe et après le sel. Cousteau, pain, vin et puis viande, puis apporter ce qu'on demande. End quote. In the Haven of Health, Thomas Coggan, London, 1636, are these verses, quoted from an earlier author. Sal primo poni debet, primoque reponi, omnis mensa male, ponitur absque sale. A curious little treatise with the title, How to Serve a Lord, specifies how the principal salt cellar shall be placed. Quote, then, hereupon, the bottler or panter shall bring forth his principal salt, he shall set the solar in the middest of the table, according to the place where the principal sovereign shall sit. Then the second salt at the lower end. Then salt cellars shall be set upon the side tables. End quote. The custom of placing salt upon the table before all else is thought to have originated in the ancient conception of this substance as the symbol of friendship, and indeed no banquet, however elaborate, was complete without it. The salt was, moreover, the last article to be removed from the hospitable board. It was as though our forefathers thereby intended that the guests, seeing salt on the table, might realize that they were, quote, invited in love, and were loved before they came, end quote. And the fact that it was allowed to remain after the other dishes had been removed might serve to remind them that while feasts, like many other good things, come to an end, love and friendship may be perpetual. Macrobius wrote in the 5th century AD that the ancients did not consider themselves as either welcome or safe at a banquet unless the salt and the shrines of their gods were placed upon the table, the former indicating a cordial greeting and the latter being a guarantee of protection. The ancient Book of Kering says, quote, Then set your salt on the right side where your sovereign shall sit, and on your left side the salt set your trenchers. End quote. Medieval salt cellars were often elaborate pieces of silver. In Paul Lacroix's Manners, Customs, and Dress during the Middle Ages are illustrations of an enameled silver salt cellar with six facings representing the labors of Hercules, which was made at Limoges for the French king Francis I in the early part of the 16th century. At Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, England, is preserved an elegantly wrought silver and golden salt cellar which belonged to Matthew Parker, who was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury in 1558. In the Art Journal, volume 39, 1887, is a description of the state salt cellar of Mostyn Hall, Flintshire, North Wales, which had been recently discovered in an ancient chest. This magnificent piece of plate, which bears the London date mark 1586-87, is eighteen and one half inches in height and of cylindrical form, surmounted by a vase and richly ornamented with groups of fruit, foliage, animals, and birds. In medieval England, the chief salt cellar was sometimes in the form of a silver ship, thus suggesting both the briny deep and the craft which sails thereon. King Henry III ordered twenty silver salts in the year 1243. In the room containing the crown jewels in the Tower of London are to be seen eleven magnificent golden salt cellars, the oldest dating from the reign of Elizabeth. Of these, the so-called state salt cellar, which is a model of the White Tower, was presented by the city of Exeter to King Charles II and was used at coronation banquets. Descriptions and illustrations of old English salt cellars of different epochs are to be found in a volume entitled Old English Plate, by Wilfred Joseph Cripps, M.A., F.S.A., 
London, 1886, and in Old Plate by J. H. Buck, New York, 1888. In the former work, mention is made of a magnificent salt cellar in the form of an oliphant, the property of John Earl of Warenes in 1347, and another in the shape of a dog belonging to Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March in 1380. From an early period until the close of the 17th century, the rank of guests at a banquet in wealthy households, as in the halls of country squires in England, was indicated by the situation of their places at table, with reference to the mass of silver centerpieces which contained the salt, sometimes called the salt vat or salt foot. At the head of the table, which is called the board's end, and above the salt, sat the host and his more distinguished guests, and during the reigns of Henry the Seventh and Eighth, it was enjoined upon the ushers to see that no person occupied a higher place than he was entitled to. Probably no penalty was imposed upon guests who unwittingly selected a more honourable seat than their rank warranted, other than removal to a lower position. But in the less civilised era of the eleventh century, the laws of King Canute provided that any person sitting at a banquet above his position should be, quote, pelted out of his place by bones at the discretion of the company without the privilege of taking offence, end quote. In a book called Strange Footpost with a Packet Full of Strange Petitions by Nixon, London, 1613, the author says in reference to a poor scholar, quote, now, as for his fare, it is lightly at the cheapest table, but he must sit under the salt. That is an axiom in such places. Then, having drawn his knife leisurably, unfolded his napkin mannerly after twice or thrice wiping his beard, if he have it, he may reach the bread on his knife's point. End quote. The Babis book, 1475, says, quote, The salt also touch not in his salaire with knockin's meat but lay it honestly on the trencher, for that is courtesy. End quote. And the Young Children's Book, 1500, contains this passage, quote, It was not graceful to take the salt except with the clean knife, far less to dip your meat into the salt cellar. End quote. Joseph Hall, in his Satires, 1597, speaking of the conditions imposed by a gentle squire upon his son's tutor, says that the latter was required to sleep in a trundle bed at the foot of his young master's couch, and that his seat at table was invariably below the salt. Again, in a volume of essays by Sir William Cornwallis, 1632, occurs the following, quote, There is another sort worse than these, that never utter anything of their own, but get jests by heart, and rob books and men of pretty tales, and yet hope for this to have a room above the salt. End quote. Quite apropos to our subject are the words of an old English ballad. Quote, Thou art a carl of mean degree, ye salt doth stand twin thee and me. End quote. The following passage from Smith's Lives of the Berkeleys refers to Lord Henry Berkeley, who dwelt in Caledon Castle near Coventry in Warwickshire in the latter part of the sixteenth century and may serve to illustrate the importance of the central salt cellar as a boundary. Quote, At Christmas and other festivals, when his neighbours were feasted in his hall, he would, in the midst of their dinner, rise from his own, and going to each of their tables, cheerfully bid them welcome, and when guests of honour and high rank filled his own table, he seated himself at the lower end, and when such guests filled but half his board, and those of meaner degree the other half, he would take his own seat between them in the midst of his long table, near the salt, which gracious considerate acts did much to gain the love that his people had for him. End quote. And in commenting on this passage, a recent writer remarks that his haughty wife, Lady Catherine, high-born and beautiful and clever though she was, could hardly be imagined as sitting below the salt, out of consideration for the feelings of an inferior. In the houses of the well-to-do farmers among the Scottish peasantry in the latter part of the 18th century, a linen cloth was sometimes spread over the upper portion of the dinner-table, where sat the farmer and the members of his family. Quite commonly, however, a chalk line divided this end of the board from the lower portion, where the hired labourers were seated, and in the more pretentious households, the salt dish served as a boundary. In Nari's Glossary, Volume 2, page 763, 
under the heading above or below the salt, the writer comments on the invidious distinctions formerly made between guests seated at the same table, and quotes as follows from Ben Jonson's Cynthia's Revels in reference to a conceited fop. Quote, His fashion is not to take knowledge of him that is beneath him in clothes. He never drinks below the salt. End quote. The inholder's company still adheres to the custom of indicating rank and social position at table by means of a handsome salt cellar of the time of James I, to which is assigned the responsible function of dividing the court from the livery at the livery dinners, the latter occupying the seats corresponding to those of the retainers in the old-time baron's hall. Among the Puritans in New England, the salt cellar was the focus of the old-time board, our ancestors brought with them, from beyond the sea, not only the ideas regarding table etiquette prevalent in the old country, but also such tangible vanities as silver plate. Miss Alice Morse Earle, in her book on the customs and fashions of old New England, says that the standing salt was often the handsomest article of table furniture, and mentions among the belongings of Comfort Star of Boston in 1659, a great silver gilt double salt cellar. Early in the 18th century, these ponderous silver vessels were superseded by the little trencher salts of various patterns which are still in use. End of section 9